The Fifteenth Wife by Sergeant Kane. This is a LibriVox recording, read in honor of the fifteenth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Matteo, my Filipino servant, was helping me sort over specimens one day on the detached roof of a shed which I had hired to use for such work while I was on the island of Culion, when I was startled to see him suddenly drop the birdskin he had been working on and fall upon his knees, bending his body forward, his face turned toward the road until his forehead touched the floor. At first, I thought he must be having some new kind of a fit peculiar to the Philippine Islands, until I happened to glance up the road toward the town, from which my house was a little distance removed, and saw coming toward us a most remarkable procession. Four native soldiers walked in front, two carrying long spears, and two carrying antiquated seven-foot muskets, relics of a former era in firearms. After the soldiers came four Visayan slaves, bearing on their shoulders a sort of platform covered with rugs and cushions, on which a woman reclined. On one side of the litter walked another slave, holding a huge umbrella so as to keep the sun's rays off the woman's face. Two more soldiers walked behind. Matteo might have been a statue or a dead man for all the attention he paid to my questions until after the procession had passed the house. Then, resuming a perpendicular position once more, he said, That was the Sultana Amea, the Sultana. Then he went on to explain that there were thirteen other sultanas, of assorted colours, who helped make home happy for the Sultan of Kulion, who, after all, well supplied as he might at first seem to be, was only a sort of fourth-class sovereign, so far as sultanas are concerned, since his fellow monarch, on a neighbouring larger island, the Sultan of Sulu, is said to have four hundred wives. A though, Matteo went on to inform me, was the only one of the fourteen who really counted. She was neither the oldest nor the youngest of the wives of the reigning ruler, but she had developed a mind of her own which had made her supreme in the palace, and besides, she was the only one of his wives who had borne a son to the monarch. For her own talents and as the mother of the heir, the people did her willing homage. When I saw the royal cavalcade go past my door, I had no idea I would ever have a chance to become more intimately acquainted with Her Majesty. But only a little while after that, circumstances made it possible for me to see more of the royal family than had probably been the privilege of any other white man. How little thought I had, when the acquaintance began, of the strange experiences it would eventually lead to. At that time, in the course of collecting natural history specimens, most of my time for three years was spent in the island of Gulion. Having a large stock of drugs for use in my work, and quite a lot of medicines, I had doctored Matteo and two or three other fellows who had worked for me, when they had been ill, with the result that I found I had come to have a reputation for medical skill, which sometimes was inconvenient. I had no idea how widely my fame had spread, though, until one morning Matteo came into my room and woke me, and with a face which expressed a good deal of anxiety, informed me that I was sent for to come to the palace. I confess I felt some concern myself, and should have felt more if I had had as much experience then as I had later, for one never knows what those three-quarters savage potentates may take it into their heads to do. When I found I was sent for because the Sultan was ill, ill unto death the messenger had made Matteo believe, and I was expected to doctor him, I did not feel much more comfortable, for I much doubted if my knowledge of diseases and my assortment of medicines were equal to coping with a serious case. If the Sultan died, I would probably be beheaded, either for not keeping him alive or for killing him. It was a great relief, then, when I reached the palace, and just before I entered the room where the sick monarch was, to hear him swearing vigorously, in a combination of the native and Spanish languages, which was as picturesque as it was expressive. 
I found a man suffering from an acute attack of neuralgia, although he did not know what was the matter with him. He had not been able to sleep for three days and nights, and the pain, all the way up and down one side of his face, had been so intense that he thought he was going to die, and almost hoped that he was. His head was tied up in a lot of cloths, not over clean, in which a dozen native doctor's charms had been folded, until the bundle was as big as four heads ought to be. As soon as I found out what was the matter, I felt relieved, for I reckoned I could manage an attack of swelled head all right. I had doctored the natives enough already to find out that they had no respect for remedies which they could not feel, and so, going back to the house, I brought from there some extra strong liniment, some tincture of red pepper, and a few powerful morphine pills. I gave my patient one of the pills the first thing, administering it in a glass of water with enough of the cayenne added to it so that the mixture brought tears to his eyes, and then removing the layers of cloth from his head and gathering in as I did so for my collection of curiosities, the various charms which I uncovered, I gave his head a vigorous shampooing with the liniment, taking pains to see that the liquor occasionally ran down into the sultan's eyes. He squirmed a good deal, but I kept on until I thought it must be about time for the morphine to begin to take effect. I kept him on morphine and red pepper for three days, but when I let up on him he was cured, and my reputation was made. It would have been too great a nuisance to have been endured had it not been that so high a degree of royal favour enabled me to pursue my work with a degree of success which otherwise I could never have hoped for. After that, I used to see a good deal of the palace life. Although nominally Mohammedans in religion, the inhabitants of these more distant islands have little more than the name of the faith and follow out few of its injunctions. As a result, I was accorded a freedom about the palace which would have been impossible in such an establishment in almost any other country. One day, the Sultan had invited me to dine with him. After the meal, while we were smoking, reclining in some cocoa nut fibre hammocks swung in the shade of the palace courtyard, I saw a manservant lead a dog through the square and down a narrow passageway through the rear of the palace. Would you like to see the green devil eat? my host asked. I have translated the native words he used by the term green devil, because that represents the idea of the original better than any other words I know of. I had not the slightest conception as to who or what the individual referred to might be, but I said at once that I would be very glad indeed to see him eat. My host swung out of the hammock. He was a supremely strong and vigorous man, now that he was in health again, and led the way through the passage. Following him, I found myself in another courtyard, larger than the first, and with more trees in it. Beneath one of these trees, in a stout cage of bamboo, was the biggest python I ever saw. He must have been fully twenty-five feet long. The cage was large enough to give the snake a chance to move about in it, and when we came in sight, he was rolling from one end to the other, with head erect, eyes glistening, and the light shimmering on his glossy scales in a way which made it easy to see why he had been given his name. I learnt later that he had not been fed for a month, and that he would not be fed again until another month had passed. Like all of his kind, he would touch none but live food. The wretched dog, who seemed to guess the fate in store for him, hung back in the rope tied about his neck, and crouched flat to the ground, too frightened even to whine. The servant unlocked a door in the side of the cage and thrust the poor beast in. I am not ashamed to say that I turned my head away. It was only a dog, but it might have been a human being, so far as the reptile or the half-savage man at my side would have cared. When I looked again, the dog was only a crushed mass of bones and flesh, about which the snake was still winding and tightening, coil after coil. We need not wait the sultan said. It will be an hour before he will swallow the food. You can come out again. I did as he suggested. It was a wonder to me, as it is to everyone, 
how a snake's throat can be distended enough to swallow a whole an object so large as this dog. But in some way, the reptile had accomplished the feat. The meal over, the huge creature had coiled down, as still, almost as if dead. He would lie in that way now, they told me, for days. It was while I stood watching the snake that a mayor came through the square, leading a boy by the hand. The apartments of the royal wives were built around this inner yard. This was the first time I had seen the heir to the throne. He was a handsome boy and looked like his mother. A mayor was tall for a native woman and carried herself with a dignity which showed that she felt the honour of her position. Matteo had told me that she had a decided will of her own and, so the palace gossips said, ruled the establishment and her associate sultanas with an unbending hand. It was not very long after I had seen the Green Devil eat that Matteo told me there had been another wedding at the palace. Matteo was an indefatigable news-gatherer and an incorrigible gossip. As the society papers would have expressed it, this wedding had been a very quiet affair. The sultan had happened to see a Visayan girl of uncommon beauty on one of the smaller islands one day, had bought her off her father for two water buffaloes, and had installed her at the palace as wife number 15. For the time being, the newcomer was said to be the royal favourite, a condition of affairs which caused the other fourteen wives as little concern as their objections, if they had expressed any, would probably have caused their royal husband. So far as Amaya was concerned, she never minded a little thing like that, but included the last arrival in the same indifferent toleration which she had extended to her predecessors. I saw the new wife only once. I mean, yes, I mean that. I saw her as the king's wife only once. She was a handsome woman, with a certain insolent disdain of those about her, which indicated that she knew her own charms, and perhaps counted too much on their being permanent. That summer, my work took me away from the island. I went to Manila and eventually to America. When I finally returned to Culion, a year had passed. I had engaged Matteo before I left to look out for such property as I left behind, and had retained my old house. I found him waiting for me and with everything in good order. That is one good thing to be said about the natives. An imagined wrong or insult may rankle in their minds for months, until they have a chance to stab you in the back. They will lie to you at times, with the most unblushing nerve, often when the truth would have served their ends so much better that it seems as if they must have been doing mendacious gymnastics simply to keep themselves in practice. But they will hardly ever steal. If they do, it will be some time when you are looking squarely at them, carrying a thing off from under your very nose, with a cleverness which they seem to think, and you can hardly help feel yourself, makes them deserve praise instead of blame. I have repeatedly left much valuable property with them, as I did in this case with Matteo, and I have come back to find every article just as I had left it. Matteo was glad to see me. Oh, Signor, he began, before my clothes were fairly changed and while he was settling my things in my bedroom. There is so much to tell you. I knew he would be bursting with news of what had happened during my absence. Such goings on, he continued, folding my travelling clothes into a tin trunk, where the white ants could not get at them. You never heard the likes of it. I am translating very freely, for I have noticed that the thoughts expressed by the Philippine gossip are very similar to those of his fellow in America, or Europe, or anywhere else, no matter how much the words may differ. The new sultana, the handsome Visayan girl, has given birth to a son, and has so bewitched the sultan by her good looks and craftiness, that he has decreed her son, and not a mayor's, to be the heir to the throne. She rules the palace now, and when her servants bear her through the streets, the people bow down to her. He added, with a look behind him to see that no one overheard, because they dare not do otherwise. In their hearts they love Amaya and hate this vain woman. How does Amaya take it? I asked. Hardly, people think, although she makes no cry. She goes not through the streets of the town now, but stays shut in her own rooms with her woman and the boy. 
a furious beating against the bamboo walls of my sleeping room, and wild cries from someone on the ground outside awoke me one morning when I had been back in Kulion less than a week. The house in which I slept, like most of the native houses in the Philippines, was built on posts several feet above the ground for the sake of coolness and as a protection against snakes and such vermin. It was very early, not yet sunrise. A servant of the sultan's, grave at fright, was pounding on the walls of the house with a long spear to wake me, begging me when I opened the lattice to come to the palace at once. I thought the monarch must have had some terrible attack and wondered what it could be. But while we were hurrying up the street, the messenger managed to make me understand that the sultan was not at the palace at all, but gone the day before on board the royal proa for a state visit to a neighbouring island from which he exacted yearly tribute. Later I learned that he had tried to have the Visayan woman go with him, but that she had willfully refused to go. What was the matter of the palace the ruler being gone, I could not make out. When I asked this of the man who had come for me, he fell into such a palsy of fear that he could say nothing. When I came to know, later, that he was a night guard at the palace, and remembered what he must have seen, I did not wonder. At the palace, no one was astir. The man had come straight for me, stopping to rouse no one else. I had saved the sultan's life, at least he thought so. Might I not do even more? My guide took me straight through the first courtyard, and down the narrow passage into the inner yard, around which were built the apartments of the woman. A mayor, I knew, lived in the rooms at one end of the square. The man led me towards the opposite end of the enclosure. Beside an open door, he stood aside for me to enter, saying, as he did so, Senor, help us. The sun had risen now, and shining full upon a lattice in the upper wall, flooded the room with a soft, clear light. The body of the Visayan woman, or rather what had been a body, lay on the floor in the centre of the room, a shapeless mass of crushed bones and flesh. An enormous python lay coiled in one corner. His mottled skin glistened in the morning light, but he did not move, and his eyes were tight shut, as were those of the green devil, after I had seen him feed. I looked backward across the courtyard. The door of the big bamboo cage beneath the trees was open. I turned to the room again and looked once more. I knew now why the night guard's face was ash-coloured and why he could not speak. For the child of the assigned woman, I could not see. End of The Fifteenth Wife by Sergeant Kane Read by Garfield D'Souza The Whores and Bods Answer to the Fifteen Comforts of Whoring, printed in 1706. Preface by Anonymous. This is a LibriVox recording, read in honor of the 15th anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Preface indeed we the ladies of pleasures and those who style themselves procurers in love affairs highly resent the late paper put out against our profession and bespattering of us for using only our own but since it is the way of the world for most men to be inclinable to love laced mutton I think it is their duty to resent the affront with us so much as to satirize the author of the fifteen comforts of whoring, who without is some young bashful effeminate fool or another that knows not how to say bo to a goose, or some old suffocated old wretch so far past his labor that he scolds for madness that he cannot give a buxom young lass her benevolence or else he may an hundred to one be one of captain risby's fraternity and so must needs be a woman-hater by course 
but let him be what he will so long as our impudence is case hardened we value not his reflections and therefore will not leave our vocation though claps and poxes should be our portion every day for according to an eminent whore now deceased clap clap ye whores clap as clap can some clap to women we'll clap to men End of preface to the whores and bods answer to the fifteen comforts of whoring by anonymous the whores and bods answer to the fifteen comforts of whoring printed in the year 1706 produced by david starner fred robinson and the online distributed proofreading team of project gutenberg this is a LibriVox recording, read in honor of the 15th anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Whores and Bods Answer to the Fifteen Comforts of Whoring Recording by Lyons McBean, Wilmington, Delaware, July 2020 Transcriber's Note The following was proofread from what appear to be scans of photocopies of a reproduction of the original text. On top of the original's battered typeface and archaic spellings, this preparer and the proofreaders before him have had to contend with dirty or faded images and missing margins. We've made our best guesses as to the missing letters, but in some cases we were stymied. Those few places are marked with a question mark, which I will replace with the word something. In addition, the most obvious printer's mistakes, transposed, missing, obviously incorrect, and even upside-down letters have been corrected. The Preface Indeed we, the ladies of pleasures, and those that style themselves procurers in love affairs, highly resent the late paper put out against our profession, and bespattering of us for using only our own. But since it is the way of the world for most men to be inclinable to love, I think it is their duty to resent the affront with us so much, as to satirize the author of the fifteen comforts of whoring, who without is some young bashful effeminate fool or another, that knows not how to say bow to a goose, or some old suffocated old wretch, so far past his labor that he scolds for madness that he, cannot give a buxom young lass her benevolence, or else he may an hundred to one be one of Captain Risby's fraternity, and so must needs be a woman-hater by course. But let him be what he will, so long as our impudence is case-hardened, we value not his reflections, and therefore will not leave our vocation, though claps and poxes should be our portion every day, for according to an eminent whore now deceased clap clap ye whores clap as clap can some clap to women we'll clap the men the first comfort of whoring answered no sooner does a maid arrive to years and she the pleasures of conjunction hears but straight her maidenhead a tiptoe runs to get her like in daughters or in sons upon some jolly lad she casts her eye and with some amorous gestures by the by she gives him great encouragement to take his fill of love and swears that for his sake she soon shall die which makes the youth so hot to get about the maiden's honey-pot that promising her marriage and the like they both a bargain very quickly strike something rubbers often take till she does prove with child then she bids adieu to love and ere she's brought to bed away does creep, for fear he should the wench's urchin keep. The second comfort of whoring answered. Now when a maid has cracked her maidenhead, by being once or twice, sir, brought to bed, her credit then so broken that all her wit and policy cannot a husband get, but yet not being out of heart she cries, from marriage keeping I shall be more wise. For if he's not a fool, he soon will find, I had before I'd him to some been kind. Then how he'd call me errant bitch and whore, And swear some stallion had been there before? 
then leave me wherefore i will single live and my invention to decoying give for as i was by fickle man betrayed so men by me too shall be bubbles made till the dull sots clandestine means do take in robbing masters for a strumpet's sake for which if they should at the gallows swing their end eyed in some merry ditty sing the third comfort of whoring answered what though of whoring it is the mishap sometimes for him that ruts to get the clap or an inveterate pox which may expose his private sports by eating off his nose how many by hard drinking will roar out with aches rheumatisms or the gout when in that gorging guzzling tippling sin there is not half the pleasure that there is in the soft embraces of a woman who although she is not to one moral true does strive to please your height of amorous lust with such a ravishing and pleasing gust that would a eunuch tempt to taste the same but that he tools does want to play the game the fourth comfort of whoring answered though buboes nodes and ulcers are the marks of many a wanton bow and amorous sparks and many a lustful lecher oft complains of restless days and damned nocturnal pains nays go into a flux a dozen weeks is it not the man himself these sorrow seeks besides how often see you go astride a miss as if she was with packthread tied who's poxed and clapped as much as you can be and undergoes a deal of misery to give your wanton appetites content something feeding you with flesh although in lent therefore as the old woman very tart once said when against thunder she did fart twas only tit for tat so if the men do clap the whores and whores clap them again tis only tit for tat tis very true what's good for goose is good for gander too the fifth comfort of whoring answered what if a man is in a married state confined to one does amorous heat abate or show me him although he were in need that always would upon one diet feed when once a woman's by a man enjoyed for good and all his appetite is cloyed therefore he fixes on some wanton miss whom rather than his wife be half he'd kiss for as it's oft reported nowadays a thing that's fresh fresh courage too will raise the sixth comfort of whoring answered what man would shun the plagues of pox and pills or all the ales that are in doctor's bills rather than not be circled in the arms of one that tempts you with a thousand charms and though she long has lost her maidenhead yet such dexterity she'll show in bed that sir your mouth would water o'er and o'er to feed again upon a skilful whore the seventh comfort of whoring answered tis true the fop that thinketh to secured to himself in private lodgings some fine whore he is a fool for she'll not be confined to any man although he's so o'er kind for being then high pampered and fed in absence of her cull she takes to bed another that with gold allures her too that she may not to her gallant be true for thinks she when her chap is tired quite and turns her off in others to delight from all she can she'll privately receive which may her great necessities relieve when that she bids adieu her master's bed to get by public jilting tricks her bread the eighth comfort of whoring answered if any man's in love with any whore why ought he not to lavish all his store upon her since to make the fop admire those pretty features which set him afire she's often at the charge of velvet hoods silk stockings velvet scarves and other goods laced shoes rich mantos gloves and diamond rings fine linen gowns and other costly things the ninth comfort of whoring answered if any has a jilt sometime sustained who has imperious o'er his pocket reigned and he's grown weary of so sweet a life or else being jealous takes to him a wife the whore can do no less than fling and tear 
and on the inconstant coxcomb vengeance swear for leaving her in this her state of sin and let the world know what the spark has been unless a pension he to her allows that she may not his roguery disclose the tenth comfort of whoring answered tis true we harlots work by various means and act our parts behind two different scenes and sometimes we do a bastard lay to those that never did so much as touch our clothes perhaps too ne'er were in our company so guineas get by this same subtlety and many times a pocket too we pick for at no mischief will a strumpet stick for once a woman's bad there's no relief by being only whore but also thief the eleventh comfort of whoring answered we'll have you know of whores are very few that will to any man ever be true to us all men for money are alike with skips as soon as bows we bargains strike and gad no sooner is a cully gone but quick another in his room gets on the twelfth comfort of whoring answered besides great charges we are at for clothes to tempt the fancies of our cringing bows we pimps and bullies keep to be our bail when sharping bailiffs nab us for a jail the thirteenth comfort of whoring answered again as we to bridewell oft are sent to undergo a flogging punishment a bribe to him that whips us then is given to have compassion to our tender skin the fourteenth comfort of whoring answered with pretty winning ways we do assure ourselves to bring the woodcocks to our lure as ogling wishfully and having tongue which though tis false yet with good language hung and if we have a voice that's good we sing and siren like our fops to ruin bring then how we strumpets do rejoice to see the wiser sex undone by lechery the fifteenth comfort of whoring answered but now good lackaday our trade's so bad that truly customers can scarce be had through those sly whores that do it in private dwell so but a story sad it is to tell our common whores can scarce their livings get by all the means of an intriguing wit for drury lane in fleet street or the strand ours we walk ere any by the hand will take us wherefore as we daggle home some prick louse tailor strutting up will come with whom for want we're forced to comply for one poor twopence wet and twopence dry finis this ends the fifteen comforts of whoring answered recording by lyons mcbean wilmington delaware july 2020chapter fifteen from fifteen years among the top knots or life in korea by l m underwood this is a librivox recording read in honour of the fifteenth anniversary of librivox all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org chapter fifteen we left Pien Yang about the 26th of September, 1900, by one of the toy Japanese steamers, and reached Chunampo, a half-Japanese, half-Korean port, at night. We were accompanied by three young ladies, one of whom, a new arrival, wished to study methods, one who needed the bracing effect of an out-of-door country life in the north for a few weeks and one who had previously arranged with me to carry on a woman's training class in Yul Yul that fall. We were obliged to spend the night in Chinampo, but, arriving late, we did not know where to find an inn, till we met an old friend, Reverend Mr. Smart, of the Church of England Mission, who kindly found us a Japanese hotel. Here, after telling them our nationality, our ages, our condition, past lives, and future intentions, and having been forced, in spite of all protests, to remove our shoes, they condescended to receive us as guests, at an outrageous price. We must not use our own camp beds, but the mats which had served no one knew whom before us. 
nor might we have water in our rooms, but must perform all our ablutions in the public hall on the lower floor. Next morning we gladly bade our two particular hosts farewell, and crossed the river in a wretched old junk, which looked as if it were on the brink of dissolution. Fortunately the weather was fine and mild, and the river calm, else I am sure we should have all been dipped, for even I had never yet beheld so dilapidated a craft. We were all day on the river, only able to land after dark, thanks partly to the nature of our vessel, and partly to the tides, for which we were forced to wait before landing. The following night was hot, the inns, nothing more or less than ovens, and morning found us all in an unusually wilted condition, and, to add to the general misery, the young ladies of our party had made important additions to their luggage, which threw us, all four, into the utmost consternation. That evening we reached Yul Yul, where both men's and women's classes were to be held. As usual, the people crowded in to meet us as soon as we arrived. Although harvesting was on, and it was one of the busiest times of the year, quite a number of women came to study with us. They were so bright and receptive, it was a pleasure to teach them. I had some very interesting visits with the women in their own homes, and was edified to see the bright and practical way in which the Christian, who accompanied us, talked with some of the unbelievers. One woman was hesitating, fearing she was too ignorant, or too wicked, to receive salvation, to which our native friend said, Why, if you are hungry, and a bowl of rice is set before you, you eat right then, and just so, if you want salvation, you have only to take and eat. The listener's eyes filled with tears. It seemed too good. All the time we were talking, another Christian woman sat with bowed head, asking God's blessing on the word. In the examination of applicants for baptism, I was much interested to see how carefully our native leaders questioned them. You say you sin daily, but ask God to forgive, and so have a happy and calm mind. Is it then no matter that you sin? Again, to a woman who said her past sins were forgiven, and her present sins were confessed every day, he said, Well then, what sin have you committed today? She could, or would, only speak in a general way, and, after various questions, mentioned nothing in particular. But, said Kim, is that honouring God, to go and confess you have sinned, and ask him to forgive you know not what? On Sunday, twenty people were baptised. During the communion service, all eyes were streaming, and some sobbed like children at the thought of what the Lord had suffered for them. In the afternoon, our native elder, Mr. Saw, gave us a delightful illustrated Bible lesson on the Christian armour, with illustrations drawn and coloured by himself and with most appropriate references. The native Christian was first represented in ordinary dress, all unarmed, and, in succeeding pictures, one after another of the needed articles, helmet, shield, sandals, breastplate, and sword were added. These illustrations were unique to the last degree, and extremely well drawn. In the evening an experience meeting was held, when one after another told what the Lord had done for them. Some had been the slaves of drink, and had fallen again and again after repeated attempts to resist, in their own strength. But now for years had been free men in Christ, and were looked upon as miracles of grace by their friends and neighbours. One man told something of his home life. He had been a dissolute gambling fellow, whose reputation was well known through all the surrounding counties. When he went home at night, after days of absence and dissipation, his angry wife would scold and reproach him, and he, in return, would beat and maltreat the poor little woman. It was all misery and discomfort, but now all peace and love. A neighbour who came in often remarked on this exceptionally happy home life, wishing hopelessly for something like it in her lot. She could not believe the happy wife when she told her it had once been so different, and that all this came through Jesus. 
then mrs kim called in her husband and bade him tell if this was true why said he i'll do more i'll give my bond for it bring paper and pen and i'll write a bond to any amount you choose to name that if jesus comes into your home there will be peace there why said he people say if the lord were only here now to do some of his miracles every one would believe but i tell you the lord is doing greater miracles now than he ever did on earth when he takes a vile wretch like me and changes his heart one man had been afflicted with an apparently incurable disease for over forty years and now the lord had healed him and one had been such a liar that no one believed his honest statements and yet now was implicitly trusted by every one it was decided before we left yule yule that the native christians of that district should employ two helpers or evangelists to work among the ignorant believers of that vicinity and that twelve bible or training classes should be held in the different districts in that province during the year six to be in charge of mr saw and six taught by mr kim yun o our most intelligent leader from yul yul we went to pung chun while mr underwood visited several smaller places more difficult of access miss chase and i divided the meetings and were most thoughtfully and attentively heard the little room being packed whenever we announced a service our quarters were not of the best as the only place assigned us for preparing our food was a little corner of the cow's stable we have heard of people who keep the pig in the kitchen but to keep the cow there was certainly a degree worse than our flightiest fancy and we at length rebelled with the result that a more sanitary place was found for our culinary performances after mr underwood arrived eleven people were baptized here the first public service for all was held in a hired room in the largest inn in the place the chief man after listening to all that had been said arose and spoke to the crowd as follows we all know that what we have heard is true there is nothing left for us to say but that from today on we will believe some of the men who attended this meeting remained outside the door at first unwilling to be seen in such company as they were respectable gentlemen after listening a while they condescended to step inside and before the service was over they had seated themselves in the front row had admitted it was very good aside from our kitchen arrangements and a little anxiety lest the cow should conclude to visit us in our bedroom at night and the persistent cock crowing at my head from two in the morning we had a lovely time at pung chun again at one of the little villages up in the mountains some of our chair coolies deserted us and there was nothing left for it but for our two young ladies to ride in an ox cart they were a little doubtful about this new mode of procedure but the koreans assured us it was quite safe and as our little son had travelled miles that way we encouraged them to try it especially as it was a last resort so with many misgivings they perched themselves on top of the loads and the ox a great spirited animal was brought up when miss chase asked if he was to be trusted they assured her with the statement that he could fight any ox in the country it was supposed a good deal of harnessing would follow but when the noose was merely slipped over a hook and with no warning the steed literally galloped off we were all somewhat startled and the young ladies gave themselves up with such a team running away the ox cart is extremely primitive its two wheels have only the clumsiest attempt at heavy wooden tires the soft mud roads are full of deep ruts so that under the most favourable circumstances the bumping and jolting are unspeakable when therefore their mettlesome animal was at length of a mind to pause a little in his mad career they lost no time in the order of their descent from that vehicle and started off at a brisk pace evidently decided to work all the way back to saul rather than jeopardize their lives in such a contrivance and behind such a creature again however the way was long and before night they changed their minds and resigned themselves to the ox-cart when his bovine spirits were a little subdued by his journey 
and he was somewhat less light and frisky than in the morning. We arrived at Chulpong, one of the villages perched up in the mountains, early in the evening, but not so our loads, which the country people manage in some miraculous way to drag up the steep mountain roads on the ox carts. It turned out that the ox cart, in use that day, was a very weak one and gave out entirely, breaking down halfway up the mountain. Another had to be brought from a distance, and long delays ensued, where the average speed is a snail's pace, in spite of the experience with the lively animal the day before. Fortunately, by this time, we had obtained more coolies for the young ladies, so that our party were all together. Our little son having become such a walker that he seldom patronised either chair or cart, and often walked twenty miles a day. One of the helpers, Mr. Shin, said, as he came up with the loads, supperless and quite tired out, at twelve o'clock that night, that, had it not been that he was determined the pastor's wife must not go without her bed and pillows, the cart would not have arrived at all. So tenderly do the people care for the needs of their teachers. We found the mountains more beautiful, if possible, than ever. It was October, and hills that in the previous spring were rosy with rhododendrons and peach blossoms were now scarlet, gold and purple, with the magnificence of autumn foliage, asters and goldenrod. There was displayed on all sides some of the most brilliant colouring I ever saw. There were quantities of bittersweet wreathing all over trees and rocks, berries of many varieties, and bushes reminding me of that which Moses saw in Horeb, burning but not consumed. And though in a different way, still I too felt that the ground was holy with the unseen but felt presence, and that it would be well to remove one's worldly shoes, which, figuratively, I did. A few days later we crossed a mountain pass at over 2,000 feet elevation, where we found the scenery more and more beautiful and wild. The gallant and unwearied captain almost carried the rheumatic partner of his travels up the last steep ascent. The alternative was to sit in a chair and trust oneself to a couple of tired coolies, who might stumble and dash one to atoms, or with Chipangi alpenstock in hand, slowly drag oneself up and then down over the rocks and steep slippery road. Arriving at the foot on the other side, we were once again in dear Sarai, where a good hot floor soon took out all the pain and weariness. It had been decided that from Sarai we were to visit a certain island called Pang Ying, or White Wing, where quite a number of people were believing through the teaching of some of the natives. The story is worth telling. A man, who had been banished to this island for a political offence, had received a Christian book from his nephew, a Methodist, just before his departure. The young man told his uncle that this religion was the basis of all civil liberty and civilization, so that the banished man, in his loneliness, proceeded to read it, and to publish and teach his doctrines among the islanders. He had been informed that on the opposite shore at Sarai lived people who could further explain the book and its doctrines. So one of the natives, the oldest and most honourable in the village, made a trip to Sarai and begged Elder Saw to return with him and teach them. They were lamentably ignorant, and while believing in Jesus, were still carrying on heathen worship. They were as blind people only partly restored, who saw men as trees walking. Saw was not able to go at once, but after some time, when he visited them, he found the whole village assembled with all the preparations made for offering their heathen sacrifices. He talked to them very earnestly and faithfully, and they then at once gave up all their idolatrous worship, and in a body promised only to serve the one true God. The elder could not, however, remain long, and several months later, when Mrs. Kim, the indefatigable voluntary evangelist, visited them, she found that many of them seemed to have fallen back almost completely into old practices and beliefs. At first no one would receive her in their homes, 
but she talked to the women outside the houses so sweetly and winningly that they at length invited her in and gathered around her to listen a great change was wrought through her teaching we made the trip in the little korean sailing junk which was rather small and uncomfortable for bad weather but not at all out of the way on such a day as that on which we started with blue sky above blue and sparkling water below and charming islands studding the sea like jewels we found that white wing measured about twenty miles round the coastline and was nine miles long with a capital and several hamlets it was extremely beautiful and fertile well fortified by bold picturesque cliffs along the coast with delightful valleys and gently rolling country snugly nestled behind them the people are all farmers living in the simplest and most primitive way money is rarely seen there is indeed no need for it with no fares or stores their wants are few they raise what they need for food clothing warmth and light on their little farms bartering among each other to supply such simple articles as their own labour has not provided all appeared to have plenty of rice and firewood and to be quite content drunkenness and dishonesty are almost unknown the magistrate told us they really needed even the slightest punishment but were as they seemed to us a gentle kindly simple honest farmer and fisher folk we found a small church built on the hillside and a little company of believers who were waiting for examination and baptism although very ignorant they were most anxious to be taught and mrs kim who had gone with me from sarai and i were kept busy instructing the women like the women everywhere in korea they especially enjoyed the hymns and were most eager to learn them the words were comparatively easy but the tunes were quite another matter we realized the advantage in their learning them both as a means of fixing divine truth and publishing it to others we were to leave very early in the morning to catch the tide and the night before we had a farewell service in the little church when this was over and good-byes said i went to the tiny room to pack our belongings and mr underwood to one of the christian houses to give last directions and counsel with the leaders about ten o'clock mrs kim came to my door with one of the women asking very humbly if i would go to one of their homes and teach them a little more this one last time though it was late we are so ignorant and have none to guide and teach us said they pathetically of course i was delighted to go and followed them to a farmer's thatched cottage it was one of the poorest and rudest of the native homes in one corner a farmhand was lying asleep in another a tiny wick burning in a saucer of oil was the only light in the room we sat down under this and the poor rough hard-working women clustered round us as closely as possible their faces and hands bore the marks of care toil hard lives and few joys but they were lighted with a glorious hope which transformed them and this with the awakening desire for knowledge had banished the look of wooden stolidity which so many korean women wear while we talked of our lord and his teachings and conned again and again the hymns a cough was heard at the door and it was found that a number of the brethren were standing out there in the cold frosty air of the november night listening to such scraps of good words as they could catch so when one of the women asked if they might come in although generally out of regard for korean custom and prejudice i not only teach no men but keep as much out of sight as possible there were on this occasion no two ways about it they must come and in they thronged it was a picture which i shall never forget the dark eager faces everyone leaning forward in eager attitude all seeking more knowledge of divine truth hungering and thirsting after righteousness a little dim humble room and only such a poor feeble wick to light them all such a poor feeble wick was i and all were looking to me for god's light feed my lambs was his last command and yet in many a hut and hamlet his hungry little ones are starving 
Next morning, at the first streak of dawn, they again came, and with tears streaming down their faces, begged me to come soon again. Oh, we are so ignorant and so weak, how can we escape the snares of Satan, with no one here to lead and teach us, they exclaimed. Our return trip was very different from our first crossing. A severe storm of wind and rain came up, the little ship was tossed about on the waves like a plaything, and Mrs. Kim and I were miserably sick, not to mention being drenched with rain. It was impossible to make our port, and we were obliged to attempt the nearest coast, which offered no shelter from the wind, in addition to which, the tide being out, our boat was bumped about mercilessly on the rocks and stones, with no chance of a landing for some hours. However, all things come to an end some time, and we, at length, effected a safe landing, and were soon dried, warmed, and fed in a fishing village at hand, and reached Sarai next day. Before we left Sarai, the Christians held their annual thanksgiving service. The church being too small to hold all the people, a tent was spread outside. After thanking God for their bountiful harvests and growing prosperity, they offered thanks for the spiritual harvest he had given. During the year, over 250 people of the neighbouring villages had been baptised through the missions and labours of this one little church, not counting a much larger number of catechumens received. They had enlarged and repaired their church and schoolrooms, built a house for their school teacher, one for their evangelist, and another for the entertainment of strangers, who come from a distance to the Sabbath services. They are an open-handed people, and when they read of the famine in India, they took up a collection, amounting to 50 yen. As their daily wage really amounts to more than 10 cents gold, and as their community is small, this was a large gift. Several of the women who had no money put their heavy silver rings in the plate. These rings are, in many cases, their only ornaments, and are most highly prized, so that, when they were given, we knew that our people were giving till they felt it deeply. In the famine so severe in many countries last year, Sarai, which was more blessed, helped many of its sister communities. On our return to Haiju, we had some interesting visits with the women, both in their own homes and at our rooms. We were allowed to help prepare the dock, or bread, which we found them making in one of the houses, for a prospective wedding. They were having a bee. A number of friends had come in to help, and they seemed much amused and pleased when we asked to be allowed to assist. We were very clumsy and awkward, but we gained our end by making them feel we were one with them. Later we were invited to the wedding, and forced to swallow an amount of indigestible food, which at other times we should consider as simply suicidal. But when it is a duty, one simply shuts one's eyes to consequences, takes all risks, and comes through with an immunity which I verily believe is miraculous. One old woman, who attended the meetings very regularly and was very devout, is quite a character, with a loud strong voice, but not the remotest glimmering of a notion of harmony, time, or tune, she shouts away several lines and bars before or behind the rest, no consequence which, and quite often, if the hymn chosen is not in her book, or according to her mind, she chooses another, and proceeds as zealously as ever. When gently remonstrated with, she replies, Oh, that is no matter, I'm not following you, I'm singing by myself. We had only been in Haiju a few days, when a fleet-footed messenger from Yul Yul arrived with a letter containing the news that a secret royal edict was being sent round to the various magistries in that province, commanding all Confucianists to gather at night on the second of the next month, about fifteen days later, each at his nearest worshipping place in his district, and from thence to go in a body and kill all Westerners and followers of Western doctrine and destroy their houses, churches, and schools. A friend in the magistrate's office, holding some petty position, happened to be present when this arrived, noted the excitement and agitation which the official evinced on reading it, and the care with which it was guarded, and determined to learn its contents. 
he contrived an opportunity to read it unseen, and as some of his near relatives were Christians, he at once communicated the terrible news to them. One of the family, a young man, who was a fleet-footed runner, was instantly sent to us with a copy of the edict. No words can express our state of mind on receiving the news. Thought flew back to one peaceful little community after another, which we had so lately visited, all rejoicing in the beautiful new life, all growing up toward Christ, like flowers reaching up to the sun, with the light of a glad hope in their faces, happy, harmless, kindly people, the aged, the little toddling children, helpless women, unsuspecting farmers, all consigned to utter destruction. As for ourselves, we were in one of the worst of Korean cities. It was impossible to make the slightest movement without attracting the notice of everyone, for we were constantly the centre of the observation of the whole town. It would be impossible to make our escape if anyone wished to detain us. To make matters much worse, we had two young ladies and a child in our party. Probably little danger threatened us personally, as the governor was friendly, but our first duty was to send word to the American minister in Seoul, and it must be done quickly. To send a dispatch in any Eastern or European language would be futile, as, if suspicion was aroused, there were means of interpreting any of them. We, at length, concluded to send a Latin message, not to our minister, but to one of our mission, as less likely to attract attention either in Haiju or Seoul. This was done, and the message was at once carried to the American legation. The news was, at first, received with incredulity. So friendly had the attitude of the government always been. But when it was remembered that recent boxer disturbances in China might have suggested a similar course here, and that there were strong Buddhists high in influence at the palace who might have caused this strange measure, and when, at the Foreign Office, through admissions and contradictions, it was made evident that the circulation of such an edict was not unknown to them, all doubt was over. Not long after, it developed that from similar sources, that is, friends of Christians or of missionaries, the news had been carried to missionaries in Kangwa and in Pyongyang. That it was unadvisedly done, and speedily repented, was proved by the fact that a few days later another edict rescinding the first was sent everywhere. Nevertheless, and notwithstanding, I breathed freely and slept well for the first time since hearing the bad news, when I found myself on the little Japanese steamer, well started on my way back to Seoul. The supposed authors of the order were put under arrest, and, I believe, punished, the Korean officials vigorously protesting that it was all a mistake and sent without the knowledge of the king or the government. These trips to Wanghai province usually occupied six or eight weeks of our time, and full of delightful incidences and experiences, as they always were, did not represent more than a fraction of the work. In the fall of 1900, the whole New Testament was given to the people. To celebrate this event, a large meeting was held in the Methodist Church, the largest audience hall in Seoul, composed of as many natives and Christians as could be packed within its walls. A suitable thanksgiving service was held, and the board of translators and their native literary helpers were presented by the American minister with copies of the book, with very kind remarks on their work. The board now consisted of Rev. H. G. Appenzeller, Dr. Scranton, Rev. W. D. Reynolds, Rev. James S. Gale, and Mr. Underwood. In addition to the editorship of a weekly religious newspaper, Bible Translation, preparation of tracts and hymns, city training classes, weekly religious services and meetings, supervision of schools and language class for missionaries, Mr Underwood felt that a special effort ought to be made for the nobility and gentry, the hardest people in the country to reach with the gospel. This is the case, partly because officials who would retain office must go at regular intervals and offer certain prayers and sacrifices at royal shrines, partly that the ideas of caste are so strong that the nobility are unwilling to seat themselves on the floor in our churches among farmers, peddlers, coolies, merchants, or even scholars, to listen to the gospel. And, in addition, 
that their family life is grounded and interwoven on and in the concubine system. All of them have two or more families, some of them many. These numerous wives, their parents and progeny, would make life intolerable should the husband put them aside. His friends and relatives would look upon him as too evil to live should he neglect to worship the ancestral tablets, and the spirits of his ancestors themselves would follow him like harpies, with all sorts of misfortunes and diseases. Each man, too, looks forward with great complacency to being honoured in his time, as he has honoured his dead parents, and seems to be overwhelmed with something like terror at the idea of having no one to worship his memory and offer sacrifices before his tablets, so that childless men usually adopt sons to keep their memory green. The ladies of this class, the first wives, are, as I think I have said before, very closely secluded, and are never seen, except in their own apartments, or the unpung of their kin, whither they are carried in closely covered chairs. In such a state of affairs, it is not strange that men should hesitate to listen to the doctrines of a religion that would turn their whole social world upside down, wreck their homes, cast upon them the blackest stigma, turn them outside the pale of court and official life, rob them of their income, and rank them with the common people. Knowing that it was almost impossible to induce them to attend a church, an invitation was therefore issued, asking a large number of them to come to our house to talk over religious matters. To our surprise, the call was most heartily responded to, and two large rooms were crowded with high Korean gentlemen, all of whom came, no doubt, from politeness or curiosity. There were princes, generals, members of the cabinet, all men of the highest rank and birth. All listened with the closest attention, many of them asking thoughtful questions, which showed their real interest in what was being said by the missionaries who came to assist Mr. Underwood in receiving and talking with them. Some asked for books, and many came repeatedly to talk over these matters in private. Meetings were held regularly Sunday afternoons, and a stereopticon exhibition was given, showing a series of scenes from the life of Christ. One result of these meetings was that Mr. Underwood was approached with the suggestion that he should establish a Presbyterian state church. We were told that a large number of officials would prefer, if they were to be forced into giving up their own religion and joining a foreign church, as at that time seemed likely, to make it one of their own choosing, and connected with Americans rather than Russians. They were, of course, informed that we could not organise churches in that way, nor baptise men for state and political purposes. The suggestion was not official, but if we had been willing to use opportunities of this sort, the roll call among the high class of nominal members might have been greatly swelled. End of chapter 15 From 15 Years Among the Top Knots or Life in Korea by L. M. Underwood Recording by Algie Pug First Corinthians chapter 15 by the Apostle Paul This is a LibriVox recording read in honor of the 15th anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. First Corinthians 15 now I declare to you, brothers, the good news which I preached to you, which also you received, in which you also stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to over five hundred brothers at once, most of whom remain until now, but some have also fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to the child born at the wrong time, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles, who is not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the assembly of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am. His grace which was given to me was not futile, but I worked more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Whether then it is I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, 
how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead but if there is no resurrection of the dead neither has christ been raised if christ has not been raised then our preaching is in vain and your faith also is in vain yes we are also found false witnesses of god because we testified about god that he raised of christ whom he didn't raise up if it is true that the dead are not raised for if the dead aren't raised neither has christ been raised if christ has not been raised your faith is in vain you are still in your sins then they also who have fallen asleep in christ have perished if we have only hoped in christ in this life we are of all men most pitiable but now christ has been raised from the dead he became the first fruit of those who are asleep for since death for since death came by man the resurrection of the dead also came by man for as in adam all die so also in christ all will be made alive but each in his own order christ the first fruits then those who are christ said is coming then the end comes when he will deliver up the kingdom to god the father when he will have abolished all rule and all authority and power for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet that last enemy that will be abolished is death for he put all things in subjection under his feet but when he says all things are put in subjection it is evident that he is accepted who subjected all things to him when all things have been subjected to him then the son will also himself be subjected to him who subjected all things to him that god may be all in all or else what will they do who are baptized for the dead if the dead aren't raised at all why then are they baptized for the dead why do we also stand in jeopardy every hour i affirm by the boasting in you which i have in christ jesus our lord i die daily if i fought with animals at ephesus for human purposes what does it profit me if the dead are not raised then let's eat and drink for tomorrow we die don't be deceived evil companionships corrupt good morals wake up righteously and don't sin for some have no knowledge of god i say this to your shame but someone will say how are the dead raised and with what kinds of body do they come you foolish one that which you yourself saw is not made alive unless it dies that which you sow you don't sow the body that will be but a bare grain maybe of wheat or of some other kind but god gives it a body even as it pleased him and to each seed a body of its own all flesh is not the same flesh but there is one flesh of men another flesh of animals another of fish and another of birds there are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies but the glory of the celestial differs from that of the terrestrial there is one glory of the sun another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars for one star differs from another star in its glory so also is the resurrection of the dead the body is sown perishable it is raised imperishable it is sown in dishonor it is raised in glory it is sown in weakness it is raised in power it is sown a natural body it is raised a spiritual body there is a natural body and there is also a spiritual body so also it is written the first man adam became a living soul the last adam became a life-giving spirit however that which is spiritual isn't first but that which is natural then that which is spiritual the first man is of the earth made of dust the second man is the lord from heaven as is the one made of dust such are those who are also made of dust and as is the heavenly such are they also that are heavenly as we have borne the image of those made of dust let's also bear the image of the heavenly now i say this brothers that flesh and blood can't inherit god's kingdom neither does the perishable inherit the imperishable behold i tell you a mystery we will not all sleep but we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will be changed for this perishable body must become imperishable and this mortal must put on immortality but when this perishable body will have become imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality then what is written will happen death is swallowed up in victory death where is your sting hades where is your victory the sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law but thanks be to god who gives us the victory through our lord jesus christ therefore my brothers be steadfast immovable always abounding in the lord's work because you know that your labor is not vain in the lord end of first corinthians chapter fifteen by the apostle paul a governor for fifteen minutes took the bull by the horns by jeff w hayes this is a librivox recording read in honor of the fifteenth anniversary of librivox all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org it was ten minutes past the midnight hour the last train for the night had pulled out 
and j frank howell the night operator at tin cup arizona began preparations for a little rest it was in the month of august and the full harvest moon beamed down through the clear atmosphere resplendent and as bright almost as the midday sun glancing out towards the south trail howell could see a horseman coming at full speed towards the lonely station a few minutes later an active fine-looking man hurried in i have a very important telegram to send to the governor i must get an answer in half an hour or an innocent man perishes come do all you can and as quickly as you can the speaker was lee henniger the sheriff of das cabezas he had ridden forty miles since nine o'clock over the sandy desert to tin cup hoping to obtain a reprieve for bob beecher who was under sentence to die at daybreak for murder a few hours previous a dying mexican had confessed to the murder of which beecher was to suffer frank howell spent five minutes in vain to raise p x he knew that the night operator there was taking press reports and could not hear him being however full of resources he called up the st louis office and sent the following message chief operator san francisco have phoenix answer on local quickly a man's life is in jeopardy signed howell tin cup it was with great joy that he heard an answering tick tick from p x a few minutes later and the following telegram was put on the wire governor smithers phoenix information just elicited that proves that beecher condemned to be executed at daybreak this morning is innocent please wire reprieve not a minute can be lost signed lee henniger sheriff the operator at p x paul g tompkins realized the importance of the message and standing san francisco off for a few minutes hastened to deliver the telegram arriving at the governor's house instead of finding the mansion dark and everybody asleep he was surprised to observe a big crowd of ladies and gentlemen seated on the veranda while strains of popular music from the ballroom filled the air tompkins quickly asked for the governor on important business and he noticed that there seemed to be some hesitancy in sending for him presently a lady the governor's wife came to the door won't your business do in the morning was asked tomkins replied in the negative and the lady withdrew a gentleman appeared to represent her the governor has retired said this gentleman and cannot be disturbed until morning tomkins inquired for the private secretary and also for the secretary of the territory and ascertained that both these functionaries were out of town can't you possibly awaken the governor queried tomkins no to tell you the truth about it the governor unfortunately drank a little too much wine and warwick whiskey and is dead to the world a gatling gun would not arouse him and he is absolutely off the face of the earth until nine o'clock in the morning was the information given young tomkins then this glorious territory is at present without a governor private secretary or secretary of the territory ejaculated tomkins as he wended his way back to the office he had made up his mind what to do and proceeded to carry out his determination he called up tin cup and sent the following telegram to lee henniger sheriff dos cabezos the reprieve is granted to robert beecher for ten days regular papers go forward in the morning mail signed h y smithers governor per paul g tompkins acting governor pro tem ten o'clock the next morning paul tompkins appeared at the capitol telegram in hand which he handed the governor who looked a wee bit groggy good heavens said the governor this telegram should have been delivered ten hours ago why was it not and the governor grew very much excited for the reason governor that you were under the weather and couldn't be wakened 
and there was nobody in the city to attend to your business replied the placid tompkins then the poor fellow is hanged by this time and i am guilty of the execution of an innocent man and the governor broke down completely that would have been true had it not been that i took the liberty of usurping your place for fifteen minutes and tompkins showed the telegram he sent in reply governor smithers was overjoyed with tompkins actions and thanked him again and again and a few weeks later he further showed his appreciation by appointing paul g tompkins to a lucrative position in the territory sheriff henniger arrived in das cabezas in the nick of time the rope was already around beecher's neck when one of the deputies who was standing near spy-glass in hand recognized his chief coming down the trail swinging aloft a paper which was proved to be the first and only official act of paul g tompkins acting governor pro tem end of a governor for fifteen minutes took the bull by the horns by jeff w hayes Here's to the Maiden of Bashful Fifteen by R. B. Sheridan. This is a LibriVox recording, read in honor of the 15th anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Here's to the Maiden of Bashful Fifteen, now to the Widow of Fifty. Here's to the flaunting, extravagant queen, and here's to the housewife that's thrifty. Let the toast pass, drink to the lass. I warrant she'll prove an excuse for the glass. Here's to the charmer whose dimples we prize, now to the damsel with none, sir. Here's to the girl with a pair of blue eyes, and now to the nymph with but one, sir. Let the toast pass, drink to the lass. I warrant she'll prove an excuse for the glass. Here's to the maid with a bosom of snow, now to her that's as brown as a berry. Here's to the wife with a face full of woe, and now to the damsel that's merry. Let the toast pass, drink to the lass. I warrant she'll prove an excuse for the glass. For let her be clumsy, or let her be slim, young or ancient, I care not a feather. So fill up a bumper, nay, fill to the brim, and let us e'en toast em together. Let the toast pass, drink to the lass. I warrant she'll prove an excuse for the glass. End of Here's to the Maiden of Bashful Fifteen by R. B. Sheridan Presidential Inaugural Address of James Buchanan, the 15th President of the United States this is a LibriVox recording. Read in honor of the 15th anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Fellow citizens, I appear before you this day to take the solemn oath that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States, and will to the best of my ability preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. In entering upon this great office, I must humbly invoke the God of our fathers for wisdom and firmness to execute its high and responsible duties in such a manner as to restore harmony and ancient friendship among the people of the several states and to preserve our free institutions throughout many generations. Convinced that I owe my election to the inherent love for the Constitution and the Union, which still animates the hearts of the American people, let me earnestly ask their powerful support in sustaining all just measures calculated to perpetuate these, the richest political blessings which heaven has ever bestowed upon any nation. Having determined not to become a candidate for re-election, I shall have no motive to influence my conduct in administering the government except the desire ably and faithfully to serve my country and to live in the grateful memory of my countrymen. We have recently passed through a presidential contest in which the passions of our fellow citizens were excited to the highest degree by questions of deep and vital importance, 
but when the people proclaimed their will, the tempest at once subsided and all was calm. The voice of the majority, speaking in the manner prescribed by the Constitution, was heard, and instant submission followed. Our own country could alone have exhibited so grand and striking a spectacle of the capacity of man for self-government. What a happy conception, then, was it for Congress to apply this simple rule that the will of the majority shall govern to the settlement of the question of domestic slavery in the territories Congress is neither to legislate slavery into any territory or state nor to exclude it therefrom, but to leave the people thereof perfectly free to form and regulate their domestic institutions in their own way, subject only to the Constitution of the United States. As a natural consequence, Congress has also prescribed that when the territory of Kansas shall be admitted as a state, it shall be received into the Union with or without slavery, as their Constitution may prescribe at the time of their admission. A difference of opinion has arisen in regard to the point of time when the people of a territory shall decide this question for themselves. This is, happily, a matter of but little practical importance. Besides, it is a judicial question, which legitimately belongs to the Supreme Court of the United States, before whom it is now pending, and will, it is understood, be speedily and finally settled. To their decision, in common with all good citizens, I shall cheerfully submit, whatever this may be, though it has ever been my individual opinion that under the Nebraska-Kansas Act, the appropriate period will be when the number of actual residents in the territory shall justify the formation of a constitution with a view to its admission as a state into the Union. But be this as it may, it is the imperative and indispensable duty of the government of the United States to secure to every resident inhabitant the free and independent expression of his opinion by his vote. The sacred right of each individual must be preserved. That being accomplished, nothing can be fairer than to leave the people of a territory free from all foreign interference to decide their own destiny for themselves, subject only to the Constitution of the United States. The whole territorial question being thus settled upon the principle of popular sovereignty, a principle as ancient as free government itself, everything of a practical nature has been decided. No other question remains for adjustment, because all agree that under the Constitution, slavery in the states is beyond the reach of any human power except that of the respective states themselves wherein it exists. May we not, then, hope that the long agitation on this subject is approaching its end, and that the geographical parties to which it has given birth, so much dreaded by the father of his country, will speedily become extinct? Most happy will it be for the country when the public mind shall be diverted from this question to others of more pressing and practical importance. Throughout the whole progress of this agitation, which has scarcely known any intermission for more than twenty years, whilst it has been productive of no positive good to any human being, it has been the prolific source of great evils to the master, to the slave, and to the whole country. It has alienated and estranged the people of the sister states from each other, and has even seriously endangered the very existence of the Union. Nor has the danger yet entirely ceased. Under our system there is a remedy for all mere political evils in the sound sense and sober judgment of the people. Time is a great corrective. Political subjects which but a few years ago excited and exasperated the public mind have passed away and are now nearly forgotten. But this question of domestic slavery is of far graver importance than any mere political question, because should the agitation continue, it may eventually endanger the personal safety of a large portion of our countrymen where the institution exists. In that event, no form of government, however admirable in itself and however productive of material benefits, can compensate for the loss of peace and domestic security around the family altar. Let every union-loving man, therefore, exert his best influence to suppress this agitation, which since the recent legislation of Congress is without any legitimate object. It is an evil omen of the times that men have undertaken to calculate the mere material value of the union. Reasoned estimates have been presented on the pecuniary profits and local advantages which would result to different states and sections from its dissolution, 
and of the comparative injuries which such an event would inflict on other states and sections even descending to this low and narrow view of the mighty question all such calculations are at fault the bare reference to a single consideration will be conclusive on this point we at present enjoy a free trade throughout our extensive and expanding country such as the world has never witnessed this trade is conducted on railroads and canals on noble rivers and arms of the sea which bind together the north and the south the east and the west of our confederacy annihilate this trade arrest its free progress by the geographical lines of jealous and hostile states and you destroy the prosperity and onward march of the whole and every part and involve all in one common ruin but such considerations important as they are in themselves sink into insignificance when we reflect on the terrible evils which would result from disunion to every portion of the confederacy to the north not more than to the south to the east not more than to the west these i shall not attempt to portray because i feel a humble confidence that the kind providence which inspired our fathers with wisdom to frame the most perfect form of government and union ever devised by man will not suffer it to perish until it shall have been peacefully instrumental by its example in the extension of civil and religious liberty throughout the world next in importance to the maintenance of the constitution and the union is the duty of preserving the government free from the taint or even the suspicion of corruption public virtue is the vital spirit of republics and history proves that when this has decayed and the love of money has usurped its place although the forms of free government may remain for a season the substance has departed forever our present financial condition is without a parallel in history no nation has ever before been embarrassed from too large a surplus in its treasury this almost necessarily gives birth to extravagant legislation it produces wild schemes of expenditure and begets a race of speculators and jobbers whose ingenuity is exerted in contriving and promoting expedients to obtain public money the purity of official agents whether rightfully or wrongfully is suspected and the character of the government suffers in the estimation of the people this in itself is a very great evil the natural mode of relief from this embarrassment is to appropriate the surplus in the treasury to great national objects for which a clear warrant can be found in the constitution among these i might mention the extinguishment of the public debt a reasonable increase of the navy which is at present inadequate to the protection of our vast tonnage afloat now greater than that of any other nation as well as to the defense of our extended seacoast it is beyond all question the true principle that no more revenue ought to be collected from the people than the amount necessary to defray the expenses of a wise economical and efficient administration of the government to reach this point it was necessary to resort to a modification of the tariff and this has i trust been accomplished in such a manner as to do as little injury as may have been practicable to our domestic manufacturers especially those necessary for the defense of our country any discrimination against a particular branch for the purpose of benefiting favored corporations individuals or interests would have been unjust to the rest of the community and inconsistent with that spirit of fairness and equality which ought to govern in the adjustment of a revenue tariff but the squandering of the public money sinks into comparative insignificance as a temptation to corruption when compared with the squandering of the public lands no nation in the tide of time has ever been blessed with so rich and noble an inheritance as we enjoy in the public lands in administering this important trust whilst it may be wise to grant portions of them for the improvement of the remainder yet we should never forget that it is our cardinal policy to reserve these lands as much as may be for actual settlers and this at moderate prices we shall thus not only best promote the prosperity of the new states and territories by furnishing them a hardy and independent race of honest and industrious citizens but shall secure homes for our children and our children's children as well as for those exiles from foreign shores who may seek in this country to improve their condition and to enjoy the blessings of civil and religious liberty such emigrants have done much to promote the growth and prosperity of the country they have proved faithful both in peace and in war after becoming citizens they are entitled under the constitution and laws 
to be placed on a perfect equality with native-born citizens, and in this character they should ever be kindly recognized. The Federal Constitution is a grant from the states to Congress of certain specific powers, and the question whether this grant should be liberally or strictly construed has more or less divided political parties from the beginning. Without entering into the argument, I desire to state at the commencement of my administration that long experience and observation have convinced me that a strict construction of the powers of the government is the only true as well as the only safe theory of the Constitution. Whenever in our past history doubtful powers have been exercised by Congress, these have never failed to produce injurious and unhappy consequences. Many such instances might be adduced if this were the proper occasion. Neither is it necessary for the public service to strain the language of the Constitution, because all the great and useful powers required for a successful administration of the government, both in peace and in war, have been granted, either in express terms or by the plainest implication. Whilst deeply convinced of these truths, I yet consider it clear that under the war-making power, Congress may appropriate money towards the construction of a military road when this is absolutely necessary for the defense of any state or territory of the Union against foreign invasion. Under the Constitution, Congress has power to declare war, to raise and support armies, to provide and maintain a navy, and to call forth the militia to repel invasions. Thus endowed, in an ample manner, with the war-making power, the corresponding duty is required that the United States shall protect each of them, the states, against invasion. Now, how is it possible to afford this protection to California and our Pacific possessions except by means of a military road through the territories of the United States, over which men and munitions of war may be speedily transported from the Atlantic states to meet and repel the invader? In the event of a war with a naval power much stronger than our own, we should then have no other available access to the Pacific coast, because such a power would instantly close the route across the isthmus of Central America. It is impossible to conceive that whilst the Constitution has expressly required Congress to defend all the states, it should yet deny to them, by any fair construction, the only possible means by which one of these states can be defended. Besides, the government, ever since its origin, has been in the constant practice of constructing military roads. It might also be wise to consider whether the love for the Union, which now animates our fellow citizens on the Pacific coast, may not be impaired by our neglect or refusal to provide for them, in their remote and isolated condition, the only means by which the power of the states on this side of the Rocky Mountains can reach them in sufficient time to protect them against invasion. I forbear for the present from expressing an opinion as to the wisest and most economical mode in which the government can lend its aid in accomplishing this great and necessary work. I believe that many of the difficulties in the way, which now appear formidable, will in a great degree vanish as soon as the nearest and best route shall have been satisfactorily ascertained. It may be proper that on this occasion I should make some brief remarks in regard to our rights and duties as a member of the great family of nations. In our intercourse with them, there are some plain principles, approved by our own experience, from which we should never depart. We ought to cultivate peace, commerce, and friendship with all nations, and this not merely as the best means of promoting our own material interests, but in a spirit of Christian benevolence towards our fellow men, wherever their lot may be cast. Our diplomacy should be direct and frank, neither seeking to obtain more nor accepting less than is our due. We ought to cherish a sacred regard for the independence of all nations, and never attempt to interfere in the domestic concerns of any, unless this shall be imperatively required by the great law of self-preservation. To avoid entangling alliances has been a maxim of our policy ever since the days of Washington, and its wisdom no one will attempt to dispute. In short, we ought to do justice in a kindly spirit to all nations, and require justice from them in return. It is our glory that whilst other nations have extended their dominions by the sword, we have never acquired any territory except by fair purchase or, as in the case of Texas, by the voluntary determination of a brave, kindred, and independent people to blend their destinies with our own. Even our acquisitions from Mexico form no exception. 
unwilling to take advantage of the fortune of war against a sister republic, we purchased these possessions under the Treaty of Peace for a sum which was considered at the time a fair equivalent. Our past history forbids that we shall in the future acquire territory unless this be sanctioned by the laws of justice and honor. Acting on this principle, no nation will have a right to interfere or to complain if in the progress of events we shall still further extend our possessions. Hitherto, in all our acquisitions, the people, under the protection of the American flag, have enjoyed civil and religious liberty, as well as equal and just laws, and have been contented, prosperous, and happy. Their trade with the rest of the world has rapidly increased, and thus every commercial nation has shared largely in their successful progress. I shall now proceed to take the oath prescribed by the Constitution, whilst humbly invoking the blessing of divine providence on this great people. March 4, 1857. End of the inaugural presidential address of the 15th President of the United States, James Buchanan. Read by Chad Jackson. In Memoriam, A. H. H., albeit 1833, Canto 15, by Alfred Law Tennyson. This is a LibriVox recording, read in honor of the 15th anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tonight, the winds begin to rise and roar from yonder dropping day. The last spread leaf is whirled away. The rooks are blown about the skies. The forest cracked, the waters curled. The cattle huddled on the lee and wildly dashed on tower and tree. The sunbeam strikes along the world. And but for fancies which ever that all thy motions gently pass, athwart a plain of molten glass. I scarce could brook the strain and stir that makes the barren branches loud, and but for fear it is not so, the wild unrest that lives in bow would dote and pour on yonder cloud that rises upward always higher and onward drags a labouring breast, And topples round the dreary west, A looming bastion fringed with fire. End of In Memoriam, A. H. H., Obeit, 1833, Canto 15, by Alfred Lord Tennyson, Read by Shreya Sethi. Lifleur by Paul Eloire. This is a LibriVox recording, read in honor of the fifteenth anniversary of LibriVox. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Les fleurs. J'ai quinze ans. Je me prends par la main. Conviction d'être jeune avec les avantages d'être très caressant. Je n'ai pas quinze ans. Du temps passé, un incomparable silence est né. Je rêve de ce beau, de ce joli monde de perles et d'herbes volées. Je suis dans tous mes états. Ne me prenez pas. Laissez-moi. Mes yeux et la fatigue doivent avoir la couleur de mes mains. Quelle grimace au soleil, mère confiance, pour n'obtenir que la pluie. Je t'assure qu'il y a aussi clair que cette histoire d'amour. Si je meurs, je ne te connais plus. End of Les Fleurs by Paul Éloire